Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the service this morning. We're glad that you folks came to join us today. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to take them and open them up to Psalm 81. Psalm 81, again, we, we, we ask you to stand, but if your body will not let you, and sometimes your body just says no, that's perfectly fine too. So if you're able and willing, Psalm 81, we invite you to stand as we read together Psalm 81. I'll begin with the title, because that's as much inspired by God as the word is. So we want to get used to reading that. And sometimes we get much information out of the title. To the chief musician upon Gittith. Before I'm going forward, see that word Gittith. It means wine press, or can also mean judgment. So it's going to be a psalm that's learned in the place of, of, of judgment, uh, pressure, difficulty. It's a psalm of Asaph. Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. For this was the statute for Israel and the law of the God of Jacob. His shoulder from the burden, his hands were delivered from the pots. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lusts, and they walked in their own counsels. I should soon have subdued their enemies, and turned my hand against their adversaries. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with the honey out of the rock, should I have satisfied thee. And we trust God's blessing to the reading of his precious word. Graham, would you come and lead us in a few songs? Yeah. Remain standing, and we'll get the old blood pumping here. <laughs> we got the three courses right off the bat, so that's going to cheer everybody up. Starting with, uh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy, that's part of the family of God. I'm so happy.
Thank you, Graham. Yeah, good job. Amen. If you have your um, where'd my announcements go, Graham? I my mother always used to say you'd lose your head if it wasn't attached to you. I think she is officially right. Thank you, Lester. All right. We want to welcome you to our worship hour this morning and trust that you'll receive a blessing as we worship the Lord together. Remember, we are here to worship the Lord uh, in our evening service tonight at 6 p.m., which we hope that you will consider coming back for uh, to worship our Lord once again. We are going to be considering victorious Christian living. Now, tonight we're going to be looking at the commissioning of Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. And I would suggest to you that if you are interested at all, in victorious Christian living, do not just think that chapter 1 of the book of Joshua is about the commissioning of Joshua. It is. But it sets the groundwork for victorious Christian living. And if you don't have the groundwork of Joshua chapter 1, you don't have a groundwork for victorious Christian life at all. So if getting the victory over sin, living a victorious Christian life is of any value to you or of any significance or importance or desire, I really would encourage you to come to tonight's message. You could stay home and uh, watch it on YouTube or listen to it over the internet. But if you have the ability to come to church, that would just be wrong. And so if you, if you can come back, and, and that's of any interest to you, tonight, I would invite you to come back tonight at 6 p.m., Victorious Christian Living, the commissioning of Joshua. But in the commissioning of Joshua, there are some beautiful, beautiful truths for living a victorious Christian life. Well, Lord willing, this Monday night also at 6.30 p.m., we're going to try to start our Grief Share program again. So weather permitting, uh, um, there will be a, a Grief Share this Monday night at 6.30 p.m. The ladies' afternoon Bible study will be starting again on February 5th. There will be a baby shower for Erica and Miriam Cripps on Saturday, February 4th at 10 a.m. in the church gymnasium. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for those who can help bring muffins, sweetbreads, or biscuits. We do want to be in prayer for David and Sue Smith as they prepare to go to Cuba. They are, by the way, going to Cuba. They're heading out to Halifax next weekend and then waiting for a flight to go. So, and if you've been paying attention to the news at all, one thing that's been happening the last little while is all these lovely flights to beautiful sun destinations have, are being canceled. And uh, we don't want that. So be in prayer for them. So um, pray that everything goes smoothly and they'll be able to leave. And please take the time to fill out the questionnaire on the back of the form. With the new year brings a possibility of new things, but not without your help. Will you be part of the ministry here at Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship in 2023? First Corinthians chapter 4, I believe, says this, that the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian believers, we have this ministry. So I want to ask you a question. Do we have a ministry in 2023? If you're able to help out, that way we know what we can do, what we can't do. We know who wants to be involved with the fellowship here. And I know you say, I filled it out last year. 2023. Last year doesn't exist anymore. We'd like to know this year if you're still able and willing to, to serve at Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship. I believe that's all the announcements at this time, but one of the things that I think that is very important that we do is if we're going to take missions seriously, and I know that we as a church do, that it's important that we pray for those who are going and, and send them out from us. And Dave and Sue, I'm going to invite them to come up uh, to, to the, uh, if it's okay, uh, to come up to, to the platform here this morning. And I'm going to invite John and Lester. Uh, uh, Jared, you stay at the sound booth because you need to run the sound. John and Lester and Carol Hill. Would you please come up front? Carol Hill, um, you wouldn't know by looking at him, he's supposed to be retired. <laughs> but he has a more active ministry and missions and burden for people. And I know he's a good friend of Dave and Sue. I'm going to ask, oh, what we're going to do is we're just going to surround them and we're going to pray for them that God will bless them. Yeah. Um, because your ministry is going to Cuba yeah. to, to see the needs of the people and to meet with them this uh, next week, I believe, is it? And correct me if I'm wrong. And so they're going down to, to meet with them, to minister them, to, to worship with them, uh, to get their heart beating. So we want to pray that God will just bless them uh, with someone canceling all their flights. Uh, yeah. Flight cancellations is not unheard of nowadays. So we want to make sure that they get there, that their flights, I uh, know Air Canada sometimes changes routes and flights. Are you with Air Canada or rest of well, suddenly, yeah, we're really going to... Turn your mic on. Amen.
Carol, I'm going to ask, and we're just going to lay our hands upon them, Carol, as a good friend and as a missionary and who's been to Cuba, would you pray for these dear brothers and sisters? Lord? I want to thank you for being a So if you have any questions for them or need, need to see if they need anything else before they leave on their trip, this week is all you have to do it before they leave. So we commit them into your hands and, and yeah. pray for them. And pray we'd like to help them. Yeah. Amen. Them all right. One Brother Graham, would you come and lead us in some more singing, please? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Um, hymn number three, Praise the Lord the Almighty. Yeah. <laughs>
might as well stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. As we uh, continue our service this morning, we're going to turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. Please uh, follow along as I read. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And God has promised to bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. This, uh, this last song, I talked to Jennifer about it, and she doesn't think I know it well enough to to sing it by myself. So everybody's got to sing real good. <laughs> real good this one. Hymn, number, uh, hymn number 19. Brethren, we have met to worship.
for your ministry. And thank you, Jen. Yeah. Before I forget, there is one more announcement. Um, and I suppose we can make this while you're turning in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15. There's one more announcement that I want to make. And uh, we're so pleased to have, uh, be able to make this. Uh, John and Dorina and Cheryl Mason have become official members of Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship. They've trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They, follow, they followed him in the waters of baptism. They want to show the world that they have decided to follow Jesus Christ. And they would like to serve the Lord here at Faith Bible Baptism. And, and so they have joined this fellowship. And John and Cheryl and Dorina, we, we want to give you... I want to run down and give you big hug and kisses. <laughs> but I will refrain myself. But we want to extend to you our fellowship and welcome you to the membership here. And FYI... I was visiting John and Dorina to check them out. And Dorina did the best thing possible. She brought out her homemade banana bread. And I'm just going to tell you, if you want to extend the right hand of fellowship to them, I would encourage you to do so in person at their house with some banana bread in front of you made by Dorina. Because I'm going to tell you the Big Stop Irving, the Circle K has nothing on her banana bread. Beautiful. So anyway, sorry to give you a secret out, Dorina. <laughs> Amen. And Cheryl, uh, their daughter, is a lovely one. She has a lovely home. She likes to decorate for the seasons, and she has the cutest little dog. What's, what's her name? Mika? Mika. So anyway, the lovely, lovely folks. And so welcome to the fellowship, and we're, we're excited that you want to serve through us here at Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship. Revelation chapter 15. Just, um, I, I, I always begin with Revelation chapter 15 because Revelation chapter 15 is the introduction to Revelation chapter 16. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Verse 1 says this, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, um, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? And glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And afterward I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon the, them that worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and must and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, O Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds." And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth, 
and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the, into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great, and the great city was divided into three parts, and the city of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, for the plague was exceeding great. Let's pause there for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you, and Lord, we bow in your presence and ask that as we look into your word today, again, Lord, we realize that what we are looking at is not a nice picture. But then again, what man who's been opposed to you has done to thy people throughout the centuries has not been nice either. And it's an awesome thing to think about that when you pour out this, this final series of judgments upon the earth, the only thing that is said is by the angels in heaven is you're, you're perfectly just in doing this. True, just and true, and they deserve what they get. Father, we live in an age of grace. And although we do deserve your judgment and your wrath, you're not willing that any should perish. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions, they fail not. Because of your mercy, you extend to us grace. You extend to us that which we do not deserve. Your salvation, your forgiveness. And so, Lord, our prayer and desire at the beginning of this message is that if there's anybody listening, if there's anybody here or, or at home or wherever they may be on the internet, and they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that today, while it is called today, they will bow their heads and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Call out to him now for salvation. And Lord, also as thy people, that we'll get serious. Time is running out. We know not when he will come back for his people, and so we know not when this time of judgment will begin. So help us, Lord, to be busy about thy business today. In Jesus' name, amen. I was listening to a a message this past week by or past couple of weeks by Dennis Lyle. Now Dennis Lyle is an Irishman. He he used to pastor, I don't know where he's at now, but he used to pastor Lurgan Baptist Church in Ireland, Northern Ireland. And I give you this information because just in case you ever want to Google him. I was listening, and I've been listening to his series of messages on Revelation 15, 16, and 17 that are found on sermonaudio.com. So I'm giving you away my resources. And I'm going to say he's a powerful preacher. He's a simplistic preacher. He brought about some interesting insights. He divided chapter 15 into three sections. And I want to just do this by way of, 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 of uh, repetition so that we just sort of remind ourselves what we looked at before we jump into chapter 16. The first suggested, uh, suggestion for Revelation chapter 15 was this. He tells us that God's purposes are explained in Revelation chapter 15. His wrath will be poured out on this world in righteousness because they have rebelled against God's law and rejected God's sacrifice for their sins. We need to understand that. God is pouring out his wrath because they have rejected his law. They have violated his law and rejected his salvation. Oh, my friends, when, when will we understand that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. I believe that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. If it's not 18, it's between 16, 17, or 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering, but there is a limit to his long-suffering. 
There is a limit to his mercy and his grace. I think sometimes we forget that and we just take it for granted. But we must never forget that. Those who will embrace his forgiveness and salvation will experience cleansing and his presence. But those who reject it will experience his wrath. He has told us of this day of judgment for thousands of years. He warned us of it. He warned the nation of Israel of it in in the Old Testament. A coming day of judgment. And in the Old Testament, there was a, 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 a twofold purpose. There was a day of judgment, God's wrath coming upon the nation and the nations around it at the immediate time. But it also pictured our future day of judgment coming. So God has been telling us about this future day that we are still waiting for. The great day of God's wrath. For thousands of years, we are without excuse If you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are without excuse. And if you continue to reject him, you will experience the wrath of God. And it is coming. And judging by what I see in the news, it's coming faster and faster and faster. Now you say, when's it going to happen? I have no idea. But here's what I know. It's one day closer than it was yesterday. It's two days closer than it was two days ago. Each day that passes, we are one day closer. And there are just way too many things in place right now. Way too many things in place. He has told us of this day of judgment for thousands of years. And in chapter 15, his purposes are explained. God's praise is expressed. I think that's an easy one to see because we see that one of the things that breaks out in this scene of heaven, uh, the, the song that he hears. They sing a song. Oh, that our churches would be filled with saints praising God. We have much to sing about. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. My friends, we ought to be singing today because we're going to be singing in heaven. We need to be a praising people and in everything give thanks. Life is not fair. It's rough, but there is a God who stands beside us, who is with us, who will never leave us nor forsake us. And though our whole world be turned upside down, yet God is still with us. If we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. And so our lives and our churches should be filled with praise. So his praise is expressed. His His purposes are explained. His praise is expressed. And then he talks about this, number three, God's patience is exhausted. He pointed out that the temple would be filled with smoke and no man was able to enter into until the seven plagues were fulfilled. It is said of the temple of God that it is to be a place of prayer. In fact, God invites us to come into his throne of grace, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I believe that's Philippians or Hebrews 4 verse 16. But here in this passage of Scripture, the the smoke of God's wrath filled the temple and no man was able to enter in. No one is allowed in to pray. He's fed up. And man is left without hope. There's only one option left. And that's his wrath. That's sad. My dear friends, before it's too late, while we are still in this age of grace, turn to him now. Tomorrow may be too late. Well, chapter 15 is just the introduction of the seven last plagues of the wrath of God. In chapter 16, we see the installment of these seven plagues. Now, before we get into this chapter, I'm going to warn you. I do not take any great pleasure in preaching through Revelation 16. I don't take pleasure in reading and preaching through the, the, the wrath of God that's poured out in the seal judgments and in the bowl judgments, the trumpet judgments. But they're given to us. And as we look at these things, and we're going to try to go through these seven last plagues today in preparation for looking at Revelation chapter 17, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not looking forward to Revelation chapter 17. Because there are identifying markers in Revelation chapter 17 so that we can know who he's talking about. And it's going to step on toes. It will make people mad. It may make you mad. And I'm not making an apology for it. All I'm saying is this. We need to pay attention. Why does God show us these things out of his word? We're just going to precursor this. I was reading through 
my devotions, and one of the things that I've been doing the last little while is I just, I just try to just do a devotional reading of the things that I'm preaching on for, for God to, to do that. And one of the things that I've been doing the last little while is saying, Lord, what's the point of all this? Like, people really don't care. Or people get tired. These are things that we haven't looked at. What's the point of all this? And as I was reading through Revelation chapter 15 and 16 again this morning, just as a devotion area, the Lord just sort of seemed to just draw some things to my attention. And so before we move forward, there's, there's no PowerPoint for this. Jared, I think I'm going to cut this mic off and just go to this mic. Um, this happens every year because of moisture. I want to just share a few things before we move into chapter 16 and look at the wrath of God. And by the way, chapter 16 is the storm he beholds, storm on earth he beholds. Before we look at that storm on earth that he beholds, why should we? And I, and I know sometimes we, we don't like looking at the book of Revelation, but why should we pay attention to these things? I put this down here. What we're going to look at is not going to be nice. We should probably put a caution on here. But why would God give us this kind of information and why should we take it seriously? I put this down here, number one, because he wants us to rest in his control. He wants us to rest in his control. One of the things that you see is his power and his sovereignty expressed in Revelation chapter 15. And of all the things that are going on in this world, and that we, we feel like our lives are in total turmoil, and my friends, our lives are in total turmoil. This world is not a nice place to live. No. Prices are going crazy. Every, anybody and everybody is lying to us, except for God. Yes. Get in the Word. There's no miss or disinformation in the Word of God. It's the proper information. It's truth. And we can get so caught up in world events. One of the things that I do is I try to go home and I... I at lunchtime, and when I'm, when I'm home, I, I turn on the news because I want to hear what they're telling. Because yeah. I, you know, I live in this world, so I want to at least know what they're telling us about, and I want to listen to some of the lies that they're telling me so that I know at least what's coming at me and what I've got to be aware of. And, and so I, I try to pay attention, but I always say, Lord, help me not to be too influenced in this because it is you who's in control. Yeah. And one of the things in the face of all this that's going on, God's saying this, I'm in control. Yeah. In fact, look at verse, look at chapter 16, verse, um, oh, verse, where are we at? Yeah. Probably in chapter 17 where it's on. Anyway, you, you see that in the song that they sing, true and righteous and just, you look down through the psalm, God, we see that God is the one in control. And he's pouring out his wrath. Uh, let's look over to chapter 17. Ver chapter 17 and verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore and shall make, war, make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now we're, we're going to look at that a little bit closer a little bit next week. Uh, in Revelation chapter 17, but basically he says this, God says, I'm going to use the Antichrist and his dominion to accomplish, his, to accomplish my will upon this mystery Babylon, this harlot in Revelation chapter 17. God says, I'm going to use them to accomplish my will. And although we see all these things going on, we need to rest in the fact that God is one in control and we can rest no matter what happens. Yeah, what happens? No matter how bad the storm comes. He's in control. Number two, I, I, I put this down here. And again, these are just my devotional thoughts before we get into the, the awfulness of chapter 16. Not only do I need to rest in his control, but secondly, I need to rejoice in his power. As we look through these things, God is doing this. He's pulling the strings. They think that they're doing their will, and, and God gives them a certain little leeway, but he's just controlling them so that his will eventually gets done. We can rejoice in his power, and God has all power, and God is going to cause things to happen in chapter 16. He's going to turn this world upside down just to show us that he's the one in control, yeah. and we can rejoice in his power. 
And my friends, I have no idea what you're going through. But here's what I know. God's able to deliver you. And he knows the way through the wilderness. And all I have to do is follow. And I can rejoice in his power. I, love, I, I don't exactly remember what psalm it is, but there's one psalm that I love to sing or love to read, especially to people in the hospital. It's, it's a psalm where it says, the psalmist was in some trouble. He cried out to God, and the, the crux of the matter is, God, then, then the, earth, the heaven shook, the earth, the earth shook, the sea waves parted, and basically it says this, God moved heaven and earth to come down and save us. And God just did all these things. He has the power. Today, before we look into this, I want you to rejoice. Why should we look at this? To rest that he's in control and rejoice in his power. Yeah. Our God is not weak. He's in One of the things that I have learned over the last few years is this. I'm not the man I used to be. Yeah. I used to be able to take my son yeah. and throw him around. Yeah. I used to be. Yeah. And, and I grew up Three boys and, a, and, a, and a, a father. My dad was a boxer, comes from a boxing family. We loved to wrestle. When, yes, when Grand Prix was in town, Atlanta Grand Prix, we were there watching it. I was brought up in wrestling, so we loved to wrestle. So I loved to wrestle with my son. You ever tried wrestling with a brick wall? So now when I jump on him to wrestle with him, I say, now, son, be careful. I, I, I break easy now. Why was I telling you that? His power. God has power. He's, he's able to deliver us. But not only do we, are we to rest in his control and rejoice in his power, but I, I also saw this in the text, that we are to fear his judgment. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. If there's one thing that is happening to our churches today, I mean, there's multiple things, and we can make lists on and on, but one thing that we must always be careful of is that we never forget who God is. And yes, I can call him Father, and yes, I can talk to him, but at the end of the day, folks, he is still God. He is not your best buddy. He is God. And he deserves the respect and the fear. Be careful. He is God, and he's to be feared. He, he's, he's, not, he, he's not to be toyed with. And my friends, if you're living in sin today, Proverbs, I think it's 16.6. It's either 16.6 or 18.6. I get the confused. I look them up. I get straight out every time. But I think it's Proverbs 16.6. that says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is uh, purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men Depart from evil. The Lord spoke to me one time. I was struggling with things in my life, and I'm going looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, uh, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And I was struggling with certain things in my life, and I said, Lord, this is not right, and if I don't get a handle on it, it's going to destroy me. Any sin will destroy you. Unchecked and un undealt with. And Lord, why am I having a trouble with this? And he took me to, to, to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Tim, you don't have a proper respect and fear for me. Yes, he's my gracious, loving, heavenly Father, and that he is. But he is God. And he expects holiness from his people. He expects certain things out of the lot. Those who name the name of Jesus Christ, he expects certain things of us. And we come to church and we just glibly, oh yes, God's my best buddy and he's my best pal. Listen to me, he's God. He's the one who gave you life and he's the one who can take it away. And you better have a proper respect and fear for God. And one of the things we learn from the, from the judgments, especially these last series of judgments, is God is to be feared. Because the world does not fear God, that's why they snub their faces at him. That's why they live their lives. They do their thing. God is a God of love. God is God to be feared. So why, again, should we reach out to this? Because since verse 15 says this, Blessed is, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Because 
I don't know when this time is going to begin and I don't know when it's going to start and I know roughly how long it will last. But since I don't know when it's going to begin and although I may be okay, I've, I've fled to the arms of Jesus. I'm underneath the blood. It was so nice, uh, the, the funeral uh, this past week or the week before for Bernice Welton. One of the things she had written in her Bible, I'm under the blood. And that's a beautiful thought. And folks, you may be under the blood. You may be saved from the wrath to come. But what about your family? What about your neighbor? What about your friends? Your coworkers? As we look at these things, we need to bear these things in mind. That's why we need to take these things seriously. Folks, when these things are not going to be nice. Let's look at them real quickly. Let's see how far we go. The storm that he beholds in chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out your vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. We should be reaching out to people because if they don't get saved, this, this is what's going to, these are the final series of wrath of God. Contagious sores. Contagious sores. This appears to be similar to the sixth plague recorded in, in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 to 12. Note the adjectives that are used with regards to these contagious sores that are part, the, the first bowl of wrath or the vial of, of the wrath of God here in, in Revelation 16. Notice the adjectives that are used. They're noisome and grievous. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it does not sound good. One might express it as festering sores from the pit of hell. Someone else has said they're a loathsome and malignant, ugly and painful festering sore. Many believe to be contagious as well, like cancerous sores. The storm he beholds. Now, if I believe that, don't you think, if this is what lies for people who have rejected God, you think the hospital's got problems now. And if I'm truly affected by this, and by the way, this is literal. I, I, I've read many commentaries who say this is figurative. There's no figurative here at all. This is literal. This is what awaits. This is the final series of seven. Not only are there contagious sores, but look at this, the contaminated seas. Verse um, three. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. As I, as I read about that, this is one of the things that I have uh, came to my mind and, and, and many other commentators have too. Some have likened it to the red tide phenomena. How many people have heard of the red tide phenomena? You want to look into that. It's something that affects the coast off of Florida and a lot of these warmer climates. Uh, harmful, and, and let me, here's a quote that I found from off of an official U.S. website. Harmful algal blooms or HABs occur when colonies of al algae, simple plants that live in the sea and fresh water, grow out of control while producing toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. The human illness caused by HABs, though rare, can be debilitating or even fatal. While many people call these blooms red tides, scientists prefer the term harmful algal bloom. One of the best known HABs in the nation occurs nearly every summer along Florida's Gulf Coast. This bloom, like many HABs, is caused by microscopic algae that produces toxins that kill fish and make shellfish dangerous to eat. The toxins may also make the surrounding air difficult to breathe. As the name suggests, the bloom of algae often turns the water red. And so if you, if you Google and research red tide, you will discover that where red tide is, if you have breathing problems, there are warnings all over the beaches, may cause asthma outflares and, and cause it hard to believe. So if the seas turn red, imagine the problem that's going to create for people breathing. 
Now, here's one to think about. If you look back at the prior judgments, you will notice in some of the prior judgments that a third of the earth is burned up, and this part is burned up, and that burned up. So now you have the vegetation dying. Now you've got the waters dying. So the vegetation is important because that's photosynthesis. They take the carbon out of the air and put back into the air oxygen. So if you have a lot of vegetation that has died, it's not taking the carbon out of the air and it's not putting oxygen back in the air. So you've got a low oxygen mixture in the air and you've got problems breathing. And now it's multiplied because now the, all this red algae bloom. You've got some major problems. Let me keep reading. Habs have been reported in every U.S. coastal state and their occurrence may be on the rise. Habs are a national concern because they affect not only the health of people and marine ecosystems, but also the health of local and re regional colonies, economies. Not all algal blooms are harmful. Most blooms, in fact, are beneficial because tiny plants are food for animals in the ocean. In fact, they are a major source of energy that fuels the ocean food web. But a percentage of algal blooms, however, produce powerful toxins that can kill fish, shellfish, mammals, birds, and may directly or indirectly cause illness in people. And that's from the National Ocean Service aspect of the U.S. government. And note the effect. Every living soul in the sea died. I believe that's literal. If the decay from rotting fish and algae and red tide can create breathing problems, imagine what this will do. Sores, you're hurt, now you can't breathe. Struggling for air. Well, it doesn't stop there. You've got contagious sores, you've got contaminated seas. Look at verses 4 to 7, you've got corrupted streams. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Again, how sad it is to think that angels declares this is what they deserve. And another from the, out of the altar cries, true and righteous are thy judgments. So you've got the, the waters of the seas. Every living soul dies. If, if it is the red tide, you've got this catastrophic effect on the seas. And the corrupted streams, that's the drinking water. You've got some major problems going on. I'm going to stop there because I've got four more pages of notes. And <laughs> Folks, there's a storm brewing and it's going to hit. This is the seven last plagues. What do you think? Are we going to just sit back and do nothing? Knowing what's going to happen. Oh, I'm glad it's not going to happen to me. But what if it happens to your children? What if it happens to your grandchildren? Does that motivate you? What about your neighbor? What about your spouse? Are we motivated? Rest in his control. Rejoice in his power. Fear him for who he is. And reach out to those around us because time is ticking away. I thought it was quite interesting. On the news this past week, I saw that they pushed forward the hands on the doomsday clock. Now, I'll save my comments on that for another day, not in the pulpit, because it's not going to be nice. However, if they've got a doomsday clock, a 
encroaches ever closer, and there within seconds of midnight. And God has said, watch. You may not know the day nor the hour, but you should know the season. I would suggest to you, the leaves are on the trees and the blossoms are almost in bloom. The fruit is ready to be reproduced. Now, when that'll happen, I have no idea. But all I know is this. I need to be busy. I need to take living for the Lord and, and reaching my community with the gospel of Jesus Christ seriously. Because time is ticking away. Again, as we look through these things, these are not judgments, not nice judgments. And they can overwhelm you if you don't have them in proper perspective. But they are to motivate us to action, to do something today. Are you motivated? Or are you still sleeping? Thus saith the Lord. He knows the end from the beginning. It's going to happen. And all we have is today. So I guess the question to you today is this. What will you do with today? Waste it on ourselves or live it and use it for his glory? That choice only you can make. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, as we look at these things, Lord, they are not nice. This world is in for a pile of hurt. And those that live within it. And you have said very pointedly and specifically, you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, we can't save anyone. But you have told us, commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Help us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Through sending missionaries, but Lord, there's a part for us too, because we can go across the street. We can go across town. There, there's a part for us. Help us to take it seriously. And Father, in all this turmoil, may we also rest in your love and find peace and strength. Help us to have a godly fear of you. Help us, Lord, to choose to strengthen the brethren in these times of difficulty. And Lord, we, we give you the thanks, the glory, and the praise. We want you to be pleased. We want to finish well. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing number 319, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. We're just going to sing the first and last verse. And I just want to challenge you this morning before you leave this place. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Our invitation to you is to do that before it's too late. Do it now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you are my Savior for what you have done for me in the cross of Calvary. And right now, as best I know how, I'm calling out to you, and I receive you as my Savior. And as Christians, this is not a game. This is going to happen. We need to be warning people. If somebody's house was on fire, would you be banging on it to get them out? Or would you just drive by and let them burn? The Spirit's speaking to you today. Maybe you need to get your act straight. I, I, I don't know. I only know what you tell me. And I only know what you show me. But if God's been speaking to you today about starting to get serious about these things, today's the day to so just come to the altar and you get right with God. The choice is yours. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to beg and plead. My days of begging and pleading are over. Either we're going to listen to the Spirit of God or we're not. And if we don't listen to the Spirit of God, we are much worse off than we ever thought. We've got a bigger problem. And we better plead for forgiveness. So let's stand and sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. The altar is open. What you do with it is your choice. Mm -hmm.